for me, when I think of the LGBTQ movement on a political front, my mind is, I'm not in the game of wanting to get LGBTQ people. I'm of a mind of wanting to protect children. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I have a very special guest, Carl Truman. He is the author of The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. I actually did a, a while back, I did a few episodes on this book. It's such a great book. And Carl Truman is the professor of biblical and religious studies at Grove City College. He is an esteemed church historian and previously served as the William E. Simon Fellow in Religion and Public Life at Princeton University. Welcome, Carl Truman. It's great to be here, Becky. Thanks for having me on. I'm so glad you're here. Uh, I love your book so much. It, it explains so much about why we are where we are today. But before we get to all that, I, I want to read just in your introduction, just to kind of tee it up, you, you kind of talk about why you even wrote this book. You say, the origins of this book lie in my curiosity about how and why a particular statement has come to be regarded as coherent and meaningful. Quote, I am a woman trapped in a man's body. Now talk about that for a second, because you, you mentioned your grandfather and what his response would have been to that statement. And, and talk a little bit more about your motivation on writing this book. Well, my interest in the statement, uh, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, derives from the fact that it's such a dramatically counterintuitive statement compared to how people have thought about the relationship between the sexes, the relationship between body and identity, a time immemorial. And yet it's come to not simply become plausible, but to become, as we see almost every day in headlines somewhere in the American press, it's come to be a kind of orthodoxy that is almost a required belief now. And yet that's happened in a very short period of time. You know, 10 years ago, I think very few people saw this coming as one of the big political issues of the next couple of decades. Really, in the space of a couple of years, perhaps since 2015, when Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner came out and transitioned, it's come to grip the public imagination. Now, when such a, a dramatic break with the past occurs and such a dramatically counterintuitive statement comes to be regarded as, as orthodoxy and truth, there has to be a reason for it. These things don't just happen in a vacuum. There has to be a reason why the ground was prepared in such a way that this apparently dramatic development was allowed to happen. And what I wanted to do in the book really was, was probe into what lies in the background, what's happened in Western culture over the last few hundred years that, that have made it the case that what appears to be a dramatic development is actually comprehensible in terms of the way the intuitions of human beings, that the way we imagine the world to be has been subtly, carefully, and dramatically reshaped over a long period of time in order to receive this, uh, this dramatically counterintuitive statement as, as orthodox truth. Yeah, and you call it the social imaginary. Uh, and, and you say in the book, you say that the sexual revolution of the 1960s didn't cause the sexual revolution, just as the French Revolution didn't cause the French Revolution. So we have to go back to the root of all of this, which is the Genevan, 18th century Genevan philosopher, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. So Rousseau is, is famous, famous for saying man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. So what does Rousseau mean by that? And what was his basic philosophy? Yeah, good question. I mean, first of all, on the point of Rousseau, I'd say I use, I use him as my starting point in the book. But of course, Rousseau doesn't cause Rousseau. One could go back right. behind him. <laughs> I chose Rousseau because I think he, he, he's a quintessential uh, bridge in some ways between the old world and the new. He captures in his thought and expresses in his thought with remarkable clarity broader cultural trends that were emerging and would become reinforced in subsequent generations. Uh, man is born free and everywhere is in chains. That's an interesting statement. Uh, first of all, it's self-evidently not true. Uh, human beings are born remarkably dependent upon other human beings. I had the pleasure 
just five weeks ago, becoming a grandfather for the first time. Two weeks ago, I met my granddaughter for the first time. She is, as I expected, remarkably dependent upon her parents at this point. Yes, She is utterly dependent upon them for food, clothing, survival. And that continues for a long time. I mean, human beings of all creatures on the face of the planet, we are remarkably slow to grow up and become independent. But just because the statement is false doesn't mean that it isn't very attractive and that, that you can't find yourself living in a society that has built itself upon the alleged truth of that statement. When you think about that statement, of course, it's making uh, a number of claims. And one of them really is this, that we could put it simplistically, but I think in a way that captures some of its truth. Uh, it's society that screws you up. We're yes. born okay. It's the social frameworks into which we find ourselves placed. It's those frameworks that mess us up. And Rousseau has, when he writes his autobiography, he has this passage where he's reflecting on, you know, why did why did he become a thief? Rousseau had this unfortunate habit when he was a younger man of stealing things, uh, and stealing he's, asparagus. He stole, of all things, he stole asparagus. <laughs> I mean, if I'm going to steal something, I want it to be something decent, you know, Ferrari or something like yeah. that. He steals asparagus, but he's interested in what's the psychology of, of this habit. And his answer is, he stole the asparagus in order to uh, sell it to make money for a poor man, Monsieur Verat, so that Monsieur Verat could buy some food. And so what Rousseau does with that, he says, you know, uh, first of all, I committed this crime out of a good motive. I wanted to help this poor man. And that was what got me into the habit of stealing. And then the habit kind of took over. And then he looks at society and says, really, that's the things that mess us up, the things that pervert our wills, the things that make us bad people. These are nothing to do with the way we are intrinsically born. It's not original sin, as a Christian would say, or, or something like that. It's the fact that society places us in social contexts where there are rivalries, jealousies, where we're always trying to get one over on each other's ambitions. And it's that context that, that messes us up. Well, when you think about that, take that a stage further, what that really does is it says that the real you is the you that exists before society gets hold of you. The man the of real, nature is, is yeah. in his thought experiment. Yeah, the noble savage. The noble savage, it's the man of nature. And when, when Rousseau explores the notion of this man of nature, this noble savage, uh, he argues that, well, the noble savage is born with the right feelings, rightly ordered feelings. But the noble savage is naturally empathetic. In fact, Rousseau goes as far as to say that as, as soon as you have laws, you know something's gone wrong, because actually we should all empathize with each other naturally and, and act in, in a natural way towards each other. Well, what Rousseau is doing there is he's really prioritizing the inner space. He's really prioritizing our inner feelings and natural psychology. He's granting those an authority, very different, say, to a view of, of growing up into adulthood, where we might say the child is born a little savage. And education is about knocking that little savage into shape. It's about curbing that savage's instincts. It's about making that little wild child into a good member of society. Rousseau said, no, the really authentic person is the natural child, those natural set of feelings. When society tries to squeeze that child into its mold, that's when problems arise. That's when people become inauthentic. We could cut to the present day and say, you know, look at the look at the language that Bruce slash Caitlyn Jenner used when he came out as trans as trans. The burden of his interview with Diane Sawyer was very much, finally, I'm free to be myself, who I've always been inside. I've been playing this role that society has demanded of me, this macho, athletic male role for all of these years, whereas really inside, I'm a woman. The man, Bruce, has been forced upon me by society. The real me is the me inside, and finally, I'm being able to express that, that inner person of nature very kind of Rousseau sort of moment. So Rousseau is very significant in, in, in the beginning of the authorizing of, of our inner feelings as defining who we are. Yeah, and let's be our authentic self. I mean, that's such a catchphrase of the day. Let's be, you know, be authentic, be authentic. And uh, it's, it's very damaging. Now contrast Rousseau's theft of asparagus to, 
August, centuries before St. Augustine's uh, theft of pears. How are they different and how are, are they completely, <laughs> how does that uh, betray their understanding of human nature? Yes, well, to your listeners who may not have read either Augustine or Rousseau, both of them write psychological autobiographies entitled Confessions. And although Rousseau says he's not writing based on any model, there's no doubt in my mind he's writing as an answer to Augustine. And that's why he includes Augustine in book two of his Confessions has this incident where he and a bunch of pals run off and steal some pears from a neighbor's garden. Rousseau's theft is the theft of asparagus. And I think when you compare the two, uh, you, you're able to see the dramatic difference between Augustine uh, and Rousseau. For Augustine, he steals the pears and, and he makes a, a big point when he's talking about stealing the pears, that the pears, they tasted horrible. He'd got better pears at home. They didn't eat them. They fed them to pigs. Uh, and Augustine, reflecting on this event from childhood, is asking, so why did I do it? I didn't gain anything from it. I didn't gain pears. I didn't gain food. I didn't do it to feed myself. I did it because it was fun. And why was it fun? Well, the answer is it was breaking the law. And, and Augustine, by a series of sort of reflections, says, bottom line is breaking the law made me feel like God. That's why it was exhilarating. It's exhilarating to transgress and break the law. I am built. I am born, Augustine would say, fallen. I'm born with this tilt away from worshipping God and obeying God and towards worshipping myself. I want to make myself feel like God. And one of the ways to do that is to break the rules. So Augustine, for Augustine, it's the background of his, uh, his pair incidents is the fact human beings in this fallen world are born wicked. And there is nothing more fun or more exciting than transgression. Rousseau is really answering Augustine there. And he's saying, no, I didn't steal because I was born wicked. Actually, I stole because I was born good. And I wanted to help Monsieur Vera. Uh, I was just misguided in the way I helped him. And then it became a habit. And then it sort of took over my life in a very unfortunate way. But the contrast between the two takes us to the very heart of the difference between Augustine's anthropology, his view of what it is to be human, and that is it's to be fallen, it's to be in conscious rebellion against God. And Rousseau's where, no, we're, we're not born fallen. We're born in a pristine state. It's society that messes us up, not our own hearts. Yeah. And so how does... What are uh, just a couple of things, uh, Rousseau, what are his ideas? How did Rousseau's ideas affect, let's say, education and crime and punishment? Just a couple of a couple of things. Yeah, I mean, it, Rousseau's fingerprints in some ways are all over modern theories of education and indeed modern theories of, of crime and punishment. On the education front, uh, some of your listeners may be familiar with the child-centered notion of education. Uh, and that's where the needs of the child and the idea that education is about allowing the child to, to express themselves, to find themselves, to, to give outward expression to who they really are. In Los not, Angeles, uh, in Los Angeles, you can imagine, I mean, all of the, the, you know, the private elementary schools are all about that. Like let the child discover himself or herself. Yeah. So yeah, <laughs> very well, familiar and, with that. And you, you see it in Florida in the current debates about the so-called don't say gay bill. Uh, that really touches, I mean, I'm not sure where Rousseau would stand on, on that particular bill, but Rousseau would certainly sympathize with the idea of education is designed to help the child discover who they already are, if we could put it that right. way. So child-centered learning, and it's not an entirely bad thing, of course. I went to a very traditional British boys' school, and I'm not sure that being, you know, having one's individuality utterly crushed in order to conform to the team <laughs> is, is necessarily yeah. the best way to go. But uh, child-centered education would be an obvious example. When it comes to crime and punishment, Rousseau stands at, at the, uh, as one of the major streams feeding into the idea that, that crime is really the result of social and cultural circumstances. Uh, and again, not entirely wrong. We all know that if I was very fortunate and blessed to grow up with a stable home with loving parents who stayed together throughout my life. Uh, and that was a great blessing and a, and a privilege. And 
I didn't grow up on the hard scrabble streaks of Philadelphia. I didn't grow up with my father in prison or anything like that. We all know that environment has an impact on tilting people, perhaps towards a life of crime or towards a more constructive life. Uh, uh, but Rousseau would be one who, who really saw that as the, the absolute foundation of, uh, of uh, the causes of crime. And therefore, the solution to, to, to crime is, is to work on the environment, not necessarily to punish the offender. And the notion of punishment for a crime is more rehabilitation than punitive. If I could put it that way. Uh, most of us think in, intuitively, particularly when the crime has been done to us, about having the person dealt with in a punitive way. The person harmed me, he needs to be punished. Rousseau's view would be the person harmed you because he was messed up by his environment. He needs to be rehabilitated. And that's a very, yeah. very different sort of take on, on the crime and punishment question. That's what the district attorney in Los Angeles, uh, Gascon, is all about. He's a he's a he's a direct descendant of Rousseau. Uh, and like, you, there are there are a lot of these DAs yes. in the country at the moment, and they're not working very well. It seems not to working me. well at all. Yes. No. And then you talk about uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, I, the quote is something about if this neither picks your pocket or breaks your legs, because I remember in the eighties uh, and may, even into the nineties, it was in terms of, you know, when I was living as a gay man back then, it, the idea was, you know, what does it matter what I do in my private, you know, bedroom? Like, why get out of my bedroom? But things yeah. have dramatically shifted since then. Yeah, yeah. And, and now, you know, people like Jack Phillips, who was on my show, who, you know, the, uh, the Christian cake baker is, uh, is going through hell because of this dramatic shift. Yeah. Talk about that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, that's an interesting shift. It's one of my favorite Jefferson quotes. I think it's from his notes on the state of Virginia, where he's talking about religion, really. And he makes the point, you know, what does it matter if my neighbor believes in uh, 20 gods or no God at all? It neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. And I don't think many of us sympathize with that. Many of us who uh, believe in freedom of religion can really track with Jefferson on that. And again, even back in the 1980s, uh, I'm a conservative Christian. I, I don't approve of homosexuality, but I've got to say, I, I don't really have a lot of interest in the, in the, the government policing people's bedrooms, what, what people do in the privacy of their own homes. I'm an Englishman. An Englishman's home is his castle. We like our <laughs> privacy from that perspective. What's shifted, of course, is, uh, is the very nature of, of identity in the self. Uh, it's one thing for me to say, you know, maybe you know, in, in, in the privacy of my own home, I like to parade around, you know, in a canary yellow suit. Well, that might be a, a major fashion faux pas, but it, it doesn't harm anybody. I might parade around in public in a canary yellow suit and it, it doesn't harm anybody. But if my proclivities or if my behaviors or if my desires become integral to who I am, then it becomes important to me that other people recognize them as legitimate. And I think the, the difference between the world of Rousseau and the world of today is this. When Rousseau, it's, it's very significant that he says, neither picks my pocket nor breaks my leg. I think if Rousseau was on this podcast uh, with us now, Beckett, we would say to him, okay, tell us about how you think of yourself. What is it to be human? I think Rousseau would probably say to be to be human and to flourish is to be left physically unharmed by people and to be allowed to own property and do business, make money and be let and, and be physically safe, physical and financial safety. That's right at the core of how Rousseau, uh, Jefferson would conceive of selfhood. Harm in that world is physical or financial. If you get beaten up, somebody steals your money, you're being harmed. Our world is very different. Our world is a world where, building on Rousseau, we are our feelings, we are our desires. And so when somebody criticizes our feelings or desires, or somebody tells us that our desires are not legitimate, or somebody tells us that our desires are less than what should be expected of a human being. 
or they, if they don't fully affirm those desires, even. Or if they don't fully affirm them. Well, in, in some ways, you know, this is between tolerance and affirmation. If you tolerate somebody, if you tolerate homosexuality, you say, I'm not going to send you to prison for it. You're free to practice it in, in the privacy of your own home, but I'm not going to approve of it. In a psychological self world, the gay person hears, well, what you're actually saying is, I'm free to be whoever I want to be in private, but you regard me as highly defective. You regard me as inferior in dramatic ways. By not affirming my identity, you're engaging in the same kind of thing that, say, Jim Crow laws engaged in in, in the 90s or, or instantiated in, in the 1940s, 1950s. So that shift from Jefferson's world to ours is really a shift to the authority and importance of feelings and desires to the extent that now if you don't acknowledge how I think of myself, then you may not be picking my pocket or breaking my leg, but you are just as surely doing me damage. Yeah. And um, I, I want to move on to the romantic poets. You talk about them. You, t- uh, you talk about Percy B. Shelley, William Wordsworth, and William Blake in the book. And Shelley was, Shelley said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Uh, and explain what that means and I, because in today's world hollywood is the unacknowledged yeah. legislator of the yeah. I mean, yeah. my old friends who create the content that people can imbibe in this in the west is is, is that's li- literally legislating the world and um and i've seen it i mean my my friend wrote he, got, he won an oscar he wrote the movie Milk by about Harvey Milk. I have a lot of friends who've created a, a many, many other shows like Will and Grace. And so talk about the romantic, talk about Percy B. Shelley and that that yeah. statement he, he makes. Well, Shelley makes that statement in the course of uh, an essay in defending poetry. And it's important to realize that when, when, per, when Shelley is using the term poet and poetry, he doesn't just mean versification. We tend to think poet, somebody who writes poems, Shelley's using the term much more broadly to mean painters, musicians. We would say the artistic community, I think, today. And he's making a point there, and he's really building on on the back of Rousseau. In fact, in that essay, he comments, he lists a number of philosophers who've influenced him. And at the end, he says, but I only regard Rousseau as a true philosopher because he was the only one who was also a poet. And he's really building on Rousseau. And he's thinking, you know, if Rousseau is right that we are our feelings, and that at a fundamental level, our morality is driven by our feelings, by our empathy. If we are the emotions we have, then the people who are most important in this world in terms of our education are those who shape those, we would say, emotional intuitions in the right way. And Shelley, building on a a tradition of uh, philosophy that's emerging really after the French Revolution, uh, is, is making the point that those intuitions are shaped not by arguments, but by feelings. And I think we can all sympathize with that to some extent. If I looked out of the window now and I see an old lady being attacked by a gang of youths, I'm not going to be Googling, you know, Kant's uh, categorical (laughs) imperatives in order to try to find out what do I need to do here? My instincts, my feelings, I'm going to feel horror. I'm going to immediately either call for help or go out and help myself. Feelings are very important in how we behave, we would say, ethically and morally towards other people. Most of us have the moral codes we have, not because we've read great tomes of ethics and morals, but because we say our moral imagination has been shaped by our upbringing and also by the things that we've read and we've we've seen. And, And Shelley's putting his finger there on the fact that art broadly conceived, shapes our imaginations and shapes our moral imaginations. And it's interesting that you raised in the, uh, the preamble to the question, Becky, you, you mentioned Will and Grace, for example, or Harvey Milk. Uh, Will and Grace, I'm convinced that when the history of, of how gay marriage became mainstream in the United States is written, uh, it won't be the philosophers of gay marriage who proved to have been the most influential. Most people who think gay marriage is okay have never read an article arguing for gay marriage, but they'll have seen Will and Grace. They'll have seen gay people presented as very likable human people 
that have been uh, given images of gay relationships working in, in very uh, good ways. Mm -hmm. Their imaginations will have been shaped by the images they've seen uh, on the screen. Harvey Milk is another one. I mean, how more sympathetic can a guy be than this man is shot and killed? He's a sort of martyr. And those images are very powerful in shaping how we we think morally about the universe in which we find ourselves. And, and Shelley, I think, is, is absolutely right that the artistic community is morally the most significant community. Kids yeah, in my yeah. houses at Grove, their world is shaped by TikTok and YouTube. I, I, I flatter myself if I think their world is shaped by my lectures. I, I hope I have some impact, but my lectures will not be as influential on them as the things they choose to watch on TikTok and YouTube. Yeah, and uh, Shelley, and by the way, Brokeback Mountain was another, it had a huge impact on the culture. Yeah. Uh, movies like that mm -hmm. and Queer Eye for the Straight Guy TV shows. Um, but Shelley was, he actually thought Christianity was evil. And why was that? Why did he, why did he believe that? And Blake as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh... Blake is slightly different because he has a sort of weird theism behind him. He's sort of influenced by Swedenborg and people. There's a sort of weird mysticism behind Blake. But both Blake, well, Shelley was more of a straight down the line atheist. But both of them uh, struck out against the institutional religion of their day, particularly the, the dominant Anglicanism of, of, of England. And the thing that they, I, th I think the thing that lies at the core of both of their objections to religion is that religion imposes monogamy on people. The thing that they most hate about Christianity is its sexual codes, that sex is meant to be confined to marriage and it's meant to be between one man and one woman for life. Shelley had two wives and a possible number of affairs. Uh, Blake tried to get his wife to agree to what we would now call an open marriage. I don't think with any great success, but both of them uh, saw religion as, as restrictive of human desire, restrictive of being able to act out on desires, specifically as focused, and specifically they focused that on the idea of lifelong monogamy, uh, heterosexual monogamous marriage is the norm. For Shelley, that was that destroyed happiness. Mm -hmm. He has this statement about marriage, you know, that it should only be binding as long as it makes each of the contracting parties happy. And as soon as that ceases to be the case, they should be allowed to move on. Interestingly enough and eloquently enough, he never mentions children in that context. They are just collateral damage, if you like, of this moving yes. on. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a purely selfish view of marriage. But it's that that he really object that that's that he finds really morally objectionable in Christianity. It crushes sexual desire through its uh, insistence on a lifelong monogamy. Yeah, and his ideas about marriage it was was kind of the progenitor to no fault divorce, as you say in your book. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know that he's the patron saint of American conservatives, but Ronald Reagan, 1970, signing into law in your great state of California. No fault divorce. I know that was surprising. I forgot when I read your book, I, I forgot about that. I was like, oh, yeah, Ronald Reagan did that. Yeah, it's and it just shows you how complicated the, the history is. But that's really when marriage is redefined. I think the the gay dimension of it is just the icing on the on the, on the cake of the redefinition. Yeah. And and William Blake, I just want to read because this is such a potent poem by him and it uh, says a lot, but I just uh, want to read, it's called The Garden of Love. And he says, I went to the Garden of Love and, and I saw and saw what I had never seen. A chapel was built in the midst where I used to play on the green and the gates of this chapel were shut and thou shalt not writ over the door. So I turned to the Garden of Love that so many sweet flowers bore. And I saw it was filled with graves and tombstones where flowers should be and priests in black gowns were walking their rounds and binding with briars my joys and desires. So can you just kind of interpret what he's saying there, what Blake is saying in this poem? Yeah, 
Well, in some ways, it's very Rousseauian in that he's wanting to go back to childhood. He's, he's remembering this garden that he used to play in, in innocence in childhood. And he goes back to it and he finds that in, instead of the beautiful flowers he expected to see there, there's a chapel built in the midst, symbol of institutional religion, of course, for Blake. And the chapel is, is not a joyous religion. It's not a, a religion of, of self-expression and self-realization. Thou shalt not is written over the door. It's, ex, it's, ex, it's exclusionary. It's repressive. It's oppressive. And so in a last desperate attempt to sort of recapture some of the freedom and vitality and joy of his childhood, uh, he turns once again to try to find these flowers. And instead of flowers, he sees graves. This is death. This religion is death. It's life killing. That's what he's saying. And it's policed by these, I suppose now we would say almost Gestapo-like figures, these sinister black cadaverous uh, figures of the priests who are there, as he said, binding with briars my joys and desires. Their sole purpose is to stop my pleasure, to stop me from realizing myself, to stop me from flourishing. And in that last couplet, he has, he changes the meter and he has that internal rhyme that's sort of really bam, 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 pushes the point home. It's one of my favorite Blake poems. Uh, I, I, I don't like the sentiment, but wow, it's a sort of, it's a powerful way of expressing that sentiment. Yeah. And, uh, and then you get into, you get into other philosophers and uh, you, Charles Darwin, you get into Nietzsche, Marx and Darwin. And, um, and you, you know, th th their philosophies and their ideas and Darwin's uh, thesis, thesis uh, really has still has a obviously a profound effect on our culture today uh i guess i just talk about because you mentioned in the book you you say you connect ariana grande the pop singer to nietzsche kind of make that connection for us yeah ariana grande is is interesting in that i uh uh i think what's striking about her is i didn't i didn't know this until some years ago when i was asked to do a skit at a faculty do at uh, Grove City College. And I thought for my skit, I thought I'd do the Christopher Walken thing. I'd read an American <laughs> pop lyric in a deadpan accent. And I'd try to find, uh, uh, I had not realized how sexually explicit uh, pop lyrics aimed at teenage girls had become. And, but I knew that Ariana Grande was, she, her, sadly one of her concerts had been bombed in, in Britain a couple of years ago. And I knew that a lot of, young 11, 12 year old girls have been this concert, so she must be safe. So I went and looked at Ariana Grande's lyrics and was horrified at the yeah. twofold horror. One, horrified at the, the explicit nature of the lyrics, and then horrified at the parents who think it's okay to take their kids, you know, 11 and 12 year old girls to a concert where these lyrics are being sung. Ariana Grande struck me as a great function of the, the amorality and the sexualization and the hedonism of our age, which I would connect very much to the kind of thinking of, of somebody like Nietzsche, and also via a slightly different path to the, to the thinking of Freud as well. So if Ariana Grande is a, a bellwether of our culture, then we really do live in, in the sort of Nietzschean world where desire uh, and amorality rule the roost. Yeah. Yeah. And then you, speaking of Freud, Freud was obviously the father of psychoanalysis. Um, I, I actually went to school in Vienna for a year and had a, uh, a strict Freudian, one of my professors was a, a very strict Freudian, uh, Dr. Lechlechner. But um, Freud claimed that human, at, at the core, human beings are sexual beings. So Freud really shifted this and sexual desires became what define us. So talk about Freud and how, how that came about and, and what that, the implications of that and, and the implications of how that contributed to LGBTQ being an identity rather than yeah. homo, because homosexual behavior, he said, when I, you know, back in the day, when I was, you know, in the eighties, homosexual uh, behavior was a behavior and now it's become a full-blown identity yeah yeah so how did freud have an effect on this well freud's interesting i mean you know he does again freud doesn't call it freud he's he doesn't emerge from a vacuum but he emerges from a very interesting 19th century context in which 
the, the sort of the manifestation of sexual behavior among children has, has, has shifted from the from being seen from sort of moral terms or disease kind of terms to being seen as a, a natural part of growing up. And I think that's the sort of Freud background that uh, infantile, young sexual behavior is not seen necessarily or, or at all as, as moral or indicating a medical or psychological condition, it comes to be seen as, as natural. And what Freud does in his, particularly in his three essays on sexuality that are published, I think, in the, the early 20th century, Freud develops a, a taxonomy of growing up that looks at the at the stages of, of development from infancy to adulthood in terms of the nature, uh, and direction and expression of sexual desire. And what that does really is it makes sexual desire essential to who we are. As you said, in, again, in your preamble to the, to the question, uh, Beckett, Sex, we often think of it as an activity. It's certainly how it's dealt with, say, in the Bible. The Bible you know, says this kind of activity is right, this kind of act sexual activity is wrong. It's, it dealt with an activity. Ancient Greece, there's all kinds of homosexual behavior going on, but as far as I know, nobody identifies as gay in, in ancient Greece. Homosexuality is something you do. It's something you indulge in. It's an action. It's not an identity. Once you start thinking of sexual desire as lying at the essential core of what it means to be a human being, and once you start thinking of changes in the nature and direction of that sexual desire as shaping where we are on the, the sort of the line developing from infancy to adulthood, you make a distinct move towards seeing sexual desire as identity. Uh, and you make a distinct move towards seeing you know, human fulfillment and flourishing as being the ability to express those desires in action. This is where, if you like, Rousseau gets darkened and sexualized by Freud. Yes, you are your inner feelings, but they're not the sort of the, the happy, winsome, empathetic feelings of the, of the noble savage. They're the dark, sexual, and often destructive desires, uh, more akin in some ways with Augustine's fallen view of humanity than, than yeah. with Rousseau. But once you start thinking of sexual desire as identity, everything changes. And again, think about laws governing homosexuality. Uh, you know, I think in, in Britain, I'm not sure when homosexuality was decriminalized. Probably it took place at different points in different states in the United States. It was late 60s in, in Britain. Uh, homosexuality was, was decriminalized. When you think about restrictions on homosexual behavior using a traditional framework where sex is behavior, you see it as akin to you know, well, you can't steal stuff or you, you can't, you know, break the speed limit or something like that. It's a restriction on behavior. Once you start seeing yourself as constituted by your sexual desires, then rules that govern what desires can be legitimately expressed and what desires cannot be legitimately expressed, they cease to be rules about behavior and really become rules about who you're allowed to be in society. And I think that's the key. Freud himself was a relatively conservative figure in many ways. But that conceptual move he makes to seeing sex as essentially who we are paves the way for modern sexual identity politics. And again, go back to the unacknowledged legislators. Listeners might be saying, yeah, but nobody reads Freud anymore. No, but that message that sex is fulfillment is preached from Nine out of 10 commercials, nine out of 10 movies, nine out of 10 sitcoms, nine out of 10 soap operas that you'll ever see. It's preached continually by the, the artistic class. Uh, and it, it percolates down into the, the imaginations of ordinary people who've never even heard of Freud. Yeah. And you, you say the genius of Freud was that he was able to articulate ideas in a scientific idiom. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, is, yeah, which it has percolated down and and in his essay his classic essay civilization and its discontents talk about what he means by that because it's it's very much rousseauian because he's he's talking about civilization and how we need a, yeah. a society it needs to be held together by religion yeah. even though he despised religion in a certain way but um 
also we're discontented in this civilization because we yeah. can't act on our id. <laughs> we yeah. can't act on yeah. our impulse, sexual impulses. Yeah. Well, Freud's idea is very much that if we are this sort of mass of dark sexual desires, uh, if we just let rip on that, then we're going to have total chaos and probably you're going to have a situation where society is, is dominated by one, two, three, a small group of very strong, violent males. And life is going to be hell on earth for pretty much every woman. Uh, it's, it's going to be impossible and workable. So what Freud sees society doing is we engage in a trade-off. We engage in a kind of social, sexual contract to, to pick up on Rousseauian kind of language where we, we establish a set of sexual norms, codes that regulate behavior. And we internalize them. It's not there that, that we are conscious of being forced upon us. It's they're internalized. We, we, they become part of how we imagine the world to be. Problem with that is it means we can never fully satisfy our instincts in the way that we would really want to. We can never really allow our unconscious to be fully satisfied by doing all the things we want to do. And so Freud says we, uh, we do uh, other things. And I, the example I use in class, forgive me the English sporting analogy here. But I, I say in class, you know, if Freud is, think about it. Uh, you, somebody crosses you in the playground at high school. You're really upset with them and you want to kill them, but you can't kill them. But what you can do is take him down on the rugby field. You can, you know, punch him in the playground. You can be expelled. <laughs> punch him on the rugby field. You're a local hero. So Freud would say we develop these other outlets for this suppressed, destructive sexual yeah. energy to find its release. What makes this significant for today and what is worrying about today, therefore, is this. If Freud is right, and I think, I think his idea that at the heart of society lie sexual codes, sexual codes are very important for maintaining civilization. If he's correct on that point, then when a society dramatically changes its sexual codes, it's doing something very serious. You could lower the, the legal age of drinking in the United States from 21 to 18, and it would make some difference. But life would go on pretty much the same. Right. If you change the sexual codes, Freud would say, that's not like tinkering with marginal rates of tax or drinking age. You're tinkering with the very DNA of society, the very thing that makes society tick. And, and we live, as, as, as your listeners will all know, in an era where sexual codes they aren't simply being moderately revised. They're being dramatically overthrown and replaced with their opposite. And that raises a very interesting question about whether civilization can sustain these changes and certainly whether it can sustain the rate of change that is that we're witnessing before us. I know it's the breakneck speed, the changes. But so and what and what were how does Freud's ideas affect sex education today? Well, I, I don't think actually Freud would, would approve of the sex education we have. Freud makes a comment that precisely because we need sexual restraint amongst adults, we need to teach kids sexual restraint as, as children. He said, if, unless you teach children sexual discipline when they're young, then you won't be able to teach it to them when they're older. It's significant that Philip Reef's biography of Freud is Freud, the mind of the moralist. Freud hates religion, but and he doesn't really believe in transcendent morality, but he still believes that morality fulfills a good social function. So Freud would want children, I think, you've got to be very careful with how you teach sex to children. Teaching children that they are their core of sexual desires and teaching them how to express those sexual desires from a very early age without any larger moral framework, Freud would say that's very dangerous. What you really have in modern sex education is Freud's anthropology, that at core we are our sexual desires, detached from Freud's notion that sexual repression is actually a good thing that serves society. Right. Uh, and this has been commonplace on the left since the, since 
really the 1960s, really articulated in the 1930s, he catches on in the 60s that sexual codes applied to children prevent children from being who they really are. Freud would say, that's a good thing. None of us should be who we really are because then you just have a society of rapists and pillagers. We need that kind of repression. Unfortunately, that is, you know, our ruling class have picked up part of Freud and run with it and have not adopted <laughs> not the, the other whole. part. No. Not the civilization part, just the disconnect no. part. Yeah. Um, yes. and, and before I get to the, my last question, because you mentioned Philip Reef and you talk about in your book about the three worlds, uh, the first, second, and third world, according to Philip Reef. Kind of d- explain what that what he means by that, and and then I want to ask you the final question, which is how the church should respond to the LGBTQ movement. Yeah, yeah, because that's related to these these different worlds we're in, because it's almost like yeah. we're talking past each other. But explain yeah. Philip Reef's theories. Well, Philip Reef is one of the great Freud scholars of the 20th century, and was also he applied Freud sociologically. His critique of late modern society was very much rooted in his reading of Freud. Uh, and Reith came up with this idea. He said societies tend to operate as in, in one of three ways, first, second and third worlds. And it's important for listeners to realize that when he's talking about third world, he doesn't mean the developing world. When we typically use third world, we're, we're, we're meaning parts of sub-Saharan Africa that are you know, economically underdeveloped or developing, something like that. Reith has his own distinctive twist. The first world, he said, is a world. A first world is a world that organizes its its moral codes, its 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 moral frameworks that make society possible. Really, in in terms of a, of a notion of of a fate or the gods. Think of the example I use in the book is Sparta. In in ancient Sparta, uh, you have a law code, and and the legend was the law code was given to the first king of Sparta, a man called Lycurgus by the gods, via the oracle at Delphi. So if a Spartan teenager says, you know, mum and dad, why do I have to do this? The answer comes back, it's the law, and you have to obey the law because it was given to us by the gods. Right. So the law carries this transcendent authority. That, uh, the second world that sort of develops in some ways out of that, Reef would identify that very much with, say, the Christian world, the Middle Ages, Jewish world or the Islamic world, where society organizes its law codes on the basis of divine revelation from one God. Right. So, for example, you know, what, why is murder wrong? Murder is wrong because human beings are made in the image of God. Ten Commandments say it's wrong. We come up with these arguments, all of which are based on the being of God in some way, in God's revelation, uh, a transcendent justification from beyond this world for the way we organize this world. Third worlds, Free Reef says, now these are different. <clears throat> worlds don't acknowledge anything transcendent. <clears throat> Third worlds find themselves in the position of having to justify their moral codes purely on the basis of themselves. And that's a kind of impossible task. Why is murder wrong? Well, Nietzsche would say, you can't say murder's wrong. It's a contract pulled off by religious people to make strong people weak. The world we live in now, when you think about how ethical debates proceed in our world at the moment, there is no appeal beyond this world to the way we organize our social, our moral codes by which we frame society. (coughs) Says, in the long run, that's a disastrous position to be in. No society has ever been able to justify itself morally on the basis of itself for any period of time that's what we see reef would say if you were alive today it's why we see the moral chaos descending in the united states everybody does what is right in their own eyes right there's less and less that binds us together that even allows us to have a discussion about moral issues we don't share enough in common as you point to the the lgbt movement or one could look at abortion the, the conservative Christian and the LGBT activist, they don't even agree on the de- grounds of debate to so sit down and have a discussion that would allow them to come to some kind of mutual understanding or even some kind of mutually respectful disagreement. Because we're, we're no, living in two no different problem. worlds and we're just talking past each other. Yes. Yeah. 
there's zero common ground. So you can't yeah. even, that's why it's kind of almost, I mean, would you agree? It's almost fruitless mm -hmm. to have a, an abort, a conversation about abortion with someone yeah. living in the third world, as it were. Yeah, it, what you notice is in such discussions is that the temperature just keeps rising you know, metaphorically and sometimes literally, the voices <laughs> just get louder and louder and louder. Twitter, to me, is a great medium for demonstrating this. Twitter is not a platform for any kind of constructive discussion to establish some mutual agreement or mutual respect. It's a way for hurling brickbats at each other or more often past each other. Yes. Uh, and that's your final question. How should the church respond to the LGBTQ movement? I, you know, it's a complicated question. I would say a couple of things. It's important for Christians to make a distinction between, I would say, the movement as a political movement and an ideology, and individuals caught up with that. Yeah. Uh, as Christians, we're to treat every human being as made in the image of God with respect, regardless of the lifestyle choices they have made, regardless of the identities that they have chosen. For themselves and certainly you know as christians or as pastors when somebody comes and says i think i'm trans or i think i'm gay or i think i'm bi or i think i'm queer i would say the first thing we need to do is to listen in order to establish some kind of relationship that allows a conversation to go forward so i want to make a distinction between individuals and the political movement yeah i think we need to be compassionate and caring with the individuals that doesn't mean we go along with everything we say that doesn't mean we don't say hard things to them at points but we have to treat them as human beings made in the image of god when it comes to the movement i think we need to be much you know much more ruthless if you want we need to realize that these are very destructive movements and we need to use all of the legitimate powers that we have as members of a free society to to put the case against we need to to use our vote to use the public town halls to use the school boards etc to make sure really this is about protecting kids to make sure kids are protected i was talking to somebody recently about the trans thing and i said you know if you're 25 and you're trans and you want to transition if, if you want to do that i'm not going to stop you what i am going to try to stop is a nine-year-old kid being encouraged to transition. I want to stop kids who aren't capable of making decisions about where to go out for dinner, <laughs> making decisions that will prevent them from having children 20 years down the line. Uh, for me, when I think of the LGBTQ movement on a political front, my mind is, I'm not in the game of wanting to get LGBTQ people. I'm of a mind of wanting to protect children. Yeah. And that would shape my response to the LGBTQ movement in public, it's protecting children that I, that I want to, to see us do. On a more positive front in the church, I think we need to make sure that our people are taught the whole counsel of God. We need, you know, we Amen. don't need to obsess or focus on the gay issue all the time. We need to teach the whole counsel of God. But we if do we need to mention it every once in a while from the, you know, from the pulpit. That would be helpful. We, we do. It does need to be mentioned and called out from the pulpit when the text or the times demanded i'm thinking more in terms of we just we need to be careful about playing whack-a-mole yeah. if we're always trying to address the latest cultural thing we'll always be one step behind if we come at the latest cultural thing from a very good grounding in the whole council of god we already have the tools to apply to the specifics uh, i think the church needs to be a strong community uh i'm sure you felt this beckett and i know that uh, our mutual friend rosaria has has written and commented on it uh, the thing that she found most shocking when she became a Christian was that the church was not as strong a community as that which she'd enjoyed when she was part of the LGBTQ community. I think if we expect if we expect people to have Christian identity, then we need to have strong Christian communities because identity is a function of the communities we're in. And the strongest identities we have often connect to the strongest communities to which we belong. The days, I think, in America where church could be once or twice on a Sunday and that's it, that's not going to be sustainable for what's coming. Right. I think we do need to be true, loving communities uh, and that welcome people in that maybe make us uncomfortable, but who are looking for Jesus 
looking for hope. We have to be prepared to 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 give those people hope. We have to shape the imagine. We have to we have to take the unacknowledged legislator idea seriously. Worship has to be something that captures the imagination, shapes our emotional intuitions. Um, I, I think we need to be very intentional in how we educate young people. Uh, the kids I teach at Grove, many of them good Christian kids will come to me and say, you know, what does the Bible teach about gay marriage? And I'll say, well, it doesn't teach directly about gay marriage, but this is what the Bible teaches about marriage. And these are the implications for gay marriage. And I, I know at the back of their mind, they're thinking, well, I, OK, I see the Bible teaches that. But does the Bible just teach that because God wants my gay friends to be miserable? So I think it's good not to replace biblical teaching with other arguments, but it's good to have these arguments drawn from medical statistics from the wider world to say the Bible teaches X. And guess what? Our experience of the world indicates that it makes sense for the Bible to teach that because the Bible really tracks with the way the world is made at that point. So I think understanding that not simply thumping or even expounding the Bible is going to be fully adequate for educating our kids. I think we need to teach them what the Bible says and then show them that it makes sense that the Bible teaches that. I like that. Very good word. And we're going to have to end there. We're out of time. We barely scratched the surface of this book. And I really, you guys, you know, I've urged you to get this book. So please do it. And are you, Carl, are you doing a kind of an abridged version of this book? I heard a rumor about that. We are, we're recording this on March the 18th and the abridged version comes out March the 22nd. So in just four days time, oh, wow. version, which is designed for, it, it's really designed for people who haven't got time to read a 400 page book. It gives you the the kernel of the argument, plus a little bit more. I've done some more thinking since I wrote the big book. And it does it in a way that would be, if you want to read it by yourself, or it'd be good for a study group, Bible study. Uh, Ryan Anderson, who did the foreword, wanted me to write it in a way that he could give it to DC staffers and policymakers who do want to read my big book, but might read a short book on the way to work. So if you're thinking, if you want to touch on this stuff for a Sunday school, the little book may be something to look at. And I've done a series of 10, 10 minute lectures that accompany it as well, that are there to sort of help stimulate discussion if you want to have group discussions around the book. And what's the title of the book? Strange New World, riffing on Aldous Huxley. Yes, Aldous Huxley. Yeah. And so we'll put the links below for both books, the, the big book and the, and the shorter book. But uh, the thank you so much, Carl Truman, for coming on. And uh, we appreciate all the all that you're doing. I mean, I, I was just so blown away by this book. And it helped me put in words what I've been thinking about for years. And so oh. thank you so much for doing that and for all that you do. I, I'm honored and encouraged that you would say that, Becky. Thank you so much. All right. Have a great birthday. It's your birthday. Thanks very much. It is. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much.